the reason Argentina as a state doesn't tax as much as a share of GDP as you think, and maybe you're right in this account, is right. not that That's it what I mean. doesn't have high taxes. It's because much of the uh, economy is not le- is not like legal. It's a uh, it's, it's illegal informal. economy. It's informal. Right. That's what we call it. Yeah, yeah. This is and, this and is Negro, this is the same it. thing that happens in Greece and Spain. Exactly. Yes. So it's not that the Argentinian government does not cannot tax. Sorry, does not want to tax. Is that it cannot tax. If inflation is is two hundred percent over a year, maybe you start thinking in terms of like a couple of weeks. Like it, that's too much. When inflation is like a thousand percent over a year, then like every week that passes, your it destroys you. Um, right. So because there's a threshold effect, because there's a fixed cost to thinking about it. Right. You know, you have a you have a cost to mental calculation. And you either decide I'm going to think about it or I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And the threshold we is don't like, have like, I'm going to increase my thinking about it a little bit. No, no, you don't exactly. you either think no. about it or you ignore it. And then the, the, the threshold is not just thinking about it. It's like, you got to call a guy to change your money, right? You got to be like, Hey, I have this extra pesos. Can you give me dollars for it? Welcome to Econ 102 where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. Welcome, everybody, to Econ 102. We're joined today with a very special guest, Sebastian Ben Susan. Uh, Sebastian and I are live here in Argentina, and uh, we just did our last week's episode uh, with Noah on inflation. And Argentina is kind of a special uh, special case when it comes to inflation, so we thought we'd do a deep dive in all things uh, all things Argentina. Uh, Sebastian, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Absolutely. So, S- Sebastian, we, we just did a deep dive on inflation last week, particularly in the U.S. and what caused it the last few years. What makes Argentina such a basket case when, when, when it comes to inflation? W- w- what makes Argentina so unique? Uh, Argentina is unique because the government always spends more money than it has. Always. Um, so in that sense, it's unique. Um, it has not learned that lesson that you cannot spend more than you earn over 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so in that way, it is, it is unique. And, and, and why is that? Don't we spend more money than we make too? Don't we always have deficits? Like what, what's, uh, what, what's, what's unique about that in Argentina? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the U.S. has the, the deficits with respect to GDP are lower compared to Argentina. They're still large, but they're lower. Um, the, the difference is that the, when Argentina needs to pay back what it owes it cannot print its way out of it unlike the us the us often can uh print its way out of it and it has in the past right um so if argentina prints pesos to pay let's say its local debt in pesos because argentina can also borrow in pesos um then it can print its way out of it in pesos but it cannot print its way out in dollars right like the foreign lenders that will give argentina dollars um will not take those pesos, they don't care. So Argentina is stuck and has to find a way to get dollars somehow. And we can talk about what those ways are. And at that point it's stuck. The US uh, is never stuck in that way, um, which is a, a huge difference between Argentina and the US. Noah, what's always intrigued you about Argentina? Or how have you as a US economist thought about the, thought about the country and their situation? Uh, well, you know, Argentina, I think ultimately it's, it's basic economy is not that interesting, right? They, they dig up some rocks and sell them like Australia does or Chile or, you know, that, or, or they farm some stuff. We yeah. mostly farm. I, I, I think our mining sector is actually super small. Yeah. We, we find, we farm okay. and for the last, for like the 2010s, mm. our main export was soy. Mm, um, yeah. That, that was the main export. We do have plenty of mining reserves at similar to Chile and Bolivia because we share borders with them and they are like, let's say, uh, embarrassingly underexplored. Uh, Chile exports copper like there's no tomorrow. Argentina has like similar, you know, access to copper, yet we don't. Yeah. So um, that, that's interesting. I wonder why they don't explore them. Yeah. The, there's, why uh, do you think that is? I think it's um, mining is... The rocks are there. Go get the rocks. Yeah. My, mining is, is, is very tricky in terms of like private property, right? Like mines are easy to confiscate that's that's the short version of it right so first they're very tricky to develop you have to um spend a lot of money to buy land and and kind of check that you know you're, you're gambling that 
when you buy this land, there's going to be something to mine. That, <laughs> um, and that's expensive um, because that, you know, maybe there's nothing to mine. Then when you do find it, um, you have to get approvals to mine it, which is expensive in a world of corruption, right? You got to pay, you got to pay people off to, to get money out. Um, you can always think of corruption as a, as, as something that will, um, compete profits away without competition, right? Uh, sure. profits can always be taken away by, by, but government. if you look at the, the some of the most corrupt countries in the world, their economies are primarily, you know, their export economies are primarily yeah. based on mining. The, the corruption, they're incredibly corrupt, but they mine a lot. Right, they mine. They dig up the rocks. I was going to say, the last thing is that then the company uh, that develops the mine needs to have a guarantee that they'll be able to extract from the mine and own the mine for many, many years. Uh, and Argentina has not a super strong history of uh, taking uh, pri uh, private property, but it has some, some history, right? It has uh, taken the oil company. Um, it privatized it in the 90s, and then it took it back uh, into the state in the 2000s, uh, 2000, yeah, after it found a huge, um, after that company had found a huge reserve of oil called Vaca Morta. Hmm. Well, yeah. So what's really interesting to me about Argentina beyond the macroeconomic stuff, which we're going to talk about for most of this episode, is that there's absolutely no idea of a development state. It's like absolute zero. Um, there's no concept of the idea that the, the government needs to enact policies to foster economic growth. Instead, it's basically a, like Argentina is a large plot of land owned by, you know, rich people um, who, you know, will have farms on that land maybe or not. But then, um, but essentially it's, it's large plots of land owned by rich people and a, and a government that attempts to redistribute the, the proceeds of those rich people's land. And um, in this, it reminds me more than anything of um, its progenitor country, Spain. It reminds me of colonial era Spain. And I think it may have even inherited some of the institutions in some way, uh, you know, with its the Spain's hacienda system. And, um, uh, or the, uh, the uh, uh, what are they called? Latifundas? Yeah. Were the, uh, the sort of the South American equivalent of haciendas? Uh, basically just like rich people own a bunch of land farmers, you know, work the land. Um, and so that, that's a, you know, it's a, it's a very extractive economy, literally extractive, you know, it's not, it's not mining, but you have, uh, peasants farming the land and then you have, and then you have rich people who are just landowners. And so, yeah, if you, if you have rich people who are landowners and a government that doesn't see the need to promote real economic growth, then the government will not go say, Hey, landowners, you're sitting on a big copper mine. How about we mine that copper? You know, they'll just be like, okay, it's your private property. You know, you do whatever you want. And then maybe, maybe we'll tax you. Or in Argentina's case, maybe we won't tax you. Maybe we'll have welfare benefits that exceed the tax, our ability to tax you. Um, but then, yeah, so it's, it's interesting because Argentina has no, ha, has not discovered a reason to be a, a nation state really yet. Um, it, it has not, it, it has no threats, no competitors. Like I think, um, what, I guess they went to war against uh, uh, Paraguay like 150 years ago or something. Um, that was like their biggest war. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I, I think you're, you're painting two broad strokes here. Um, first, when I was saying that Argentina is mostly an agricultural economy, I meant it in exports. Argentina is very right. a poor, poor competitive uh, economy, meaning like it, its exports don't do well, but agricultural exports do well. Now, domestically, it produces a lot of stuff. So it is not accurate to say that it is just an extractive economy. Most of the cars that we buy in Argentina are, you know, locally made. So when you go around, there's barely any imports, yet the country feels pretty rich. Rich meaning you can buy a lot of stuff that is produced here. So I think it's a stretch to say that the only thing we do here is, is um, you know, the extract from the land, uh, given that we make cars and there's, a, you know, there's an industry that makes things. And that's kind of what the country runs on. Um, right. So there's a little bit more than that. And there's a whole class of people that live of that industry. Uh, I know many of them. Um, so I wouldn't say it's like the only thing that we do. And then second, in terms of being a nation state, uh, that's not that accurate. Like the, the reason Argentina became a nation state was to fight the Spanish, right? It's like, hey, uh, we have this Span Spaniard lords. They, they tax us. It's much like the US. Uh, they tax us a little bit too much. And we don't like that. So we're going to you know fight a war against them uh, and gain independence. So there was a very strong need for that. And when that happened, 
then the kind of the content broke up into pieces. Uh, Argentina was one of those pieces. And there's a gap for land, right? Like what part of that are, of South America would be Argentina versus not? There was a, there's a, that was not clear. Uh, the Argentinian army at the time did a lot of work, let's put it that way, to make sure that the borders are what they are. And in some ways they won, it's huge, Argentina's huge. Um, the main wars that were fought, yeah, Paraguay was one of them, but I think the more important ones was against Brazil. Brazil represented the kind of counterpart of another empire, right? Like the, the Portuguese empire. And Brazil wanted to kind of take over as well. And Argentina and Brazil fought a few times over what is now uh, Uruguay, right? Uh, and right. Uruguay is in the 1800s. The result of, in the 1800s. In the 1800s, yes, yes, yes. A long time right. Ago. It's all in the 1800s. And so by the time yes. that you get major industrialization, you know, the, these were these these armies had gunpowder and like you know old cannons and horses, right? By the time yeah. you get major industrialization, there's no you know in, in Europe if you are you know. Poland or something, there's a there's an incentive to industrialize because you're right next to Germany and Russia that could attack you and kill you. Or if you're France yeah. or who, any of these countries, right? Uh, there was this incentive to industrialize. And I think a lot of the literature on the development of institutions, you know, the development state, pro-development institutions in Europe has to do with the pressure of war. Um, and so, uh, but then in, in, you know, Latin America, there was less pressure. There, there was some, you know, I mean, like they had some wars in the, in the 1800s, but those essentially stopped. Yeah. And one of the reasons was because of the international economy. So the industrialized countries could just, Im could import tons of commodities in Argentina's case, food, um, you know, or, or, or mineral commodities. And that sort of satisfied people, you know, like they, um, but then again, you know, you, it would have been possible to go to war to like take productive land or take mines from neighbors. You know, of course, Saddam Hussein tried to do that to Iran. He tried to take some oil from oil fields from Iran. It didn't go well. But then what's interesting is that they're actually since the era of industrialization, since commodity prices soared because commodities had to go to feed the industrial machines of other countries. Um, you did not see a lot of wars in Latin America over mines. And and now you're seeing Venezuela threaten to do this with um, with uh, uh, Guyana. Guyana. I can't even pronounce it. It's, sorry. Guyana. It's, they're, they're threatening to do this, but, but th this is sort of new and you didn't see this much, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, I, I think that's kind of a tangent because, you know, Argentina, Argentina's lack of development state kind of fascinates me. But I think right now we're here to talk about macroeconomics, you know, not the development state, but the welfare state, because uh, ultimately Argentina's macroeconomic problems come from uh, its welfare state. Um, Argentina has extremely generous welfare state, so generous that they don't actually publish the numbers in the, um, in the official statistics. When you try to look at uh, public social spending as a share of GDP, the OECD doesn't even have them. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to find, uh, data on exactly how much Argentina spends on welfare, but you know, what, what pieces of evidence I can find indicate that it's a lot and it's a lot. They don't have very high taxes. You know, you can you can be like Denmark or or something or Sweden. That's not quite. That's not quite true. Argentina has quite uh, has high taxes, but they don't work the way you'd expect them to. So um, the the first part is that Argentina has taxes as high as it can. Um, for example, if you think about how soy gets taxed, um, soy gets taxed in like three ways, and the effective tax rate is like eighty percent. It's like a, a, an insane amount. Like, don't quote me on an eighty, but it's like close to that. Um, the reason Argentina as a state doesn't tax as much as a share of GDP as you think, and maybe you're right in this account, is not right. that That's it I mean. doesn't have high taxes. It's because much of the uh, economy is not, is not like legal. It's a, it's, it's illegal informal. economy. It's informal. Right. That's what we call it. Yeah. yeah. This is, in, this in is, this is the same it. thing that happens in Greece and Spain. Exactly. Yes. So it's not that the Argentinian government does not cannot tax, sorry, does not want to tax is that it cannot tax because people kind of spend cash and they call each other and they say, Hey, do you really need a receipt? And then you say, what discount do I get if I, if I don't have a receipt? And they say 10%, 20%. And you say, great, I'll pay cash. Then. No receipt for me. Thank you. Uh, and all of this happens while there's a big sign behind the store that says like, always ask for a receipt, you know, IRS. Uh, and, right. and right be below that sign, you right. are saying like, please no receipt. Thank you. Hey everybody, Eric here with a word from our sponsor. 
Have you ever wondered where your donation could have the most impact? In 2007, a group of donors had that exact question. But when they sought out information from charities to help them answer this question, they instead received cute pictures or unhelpful stories. Their experience led them to create GiveWell, an organization providing rigorous, transparent research about the best giving opportunities they've found. GiveWell has now spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found in global health and poverty alleviation. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. You can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities, and GiveWell doesn't take a cut. If you've never donated through GiveWell before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org, pick podcast, and enter Econ 102 at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Econ 102 to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. And this is Greece too. That's how Greece works. Absolutely. And um, I, Ar Argentina is interesting. It's a, it's a Southern European economy uh, that just happened to land in Latin America. Absolutely. So when I say they don't tax, uh, what I mean is that they, I, I don't mean that they don't have high tax rates. I mean that they, they fail to collect enough in taxes to pay for what they're spending. Absolutely. And so they run high structural deficits, which is different than, you know, a temporary deficit to like pay for, you know, COVID stuff or, or whatever, or a stimulus or a war. And it's also different from uh, the deficit that's the interest paid on the debt. Um, this is deficit that's just government spends more than it makes. It's yeah. kind of almost what we classically think of is like in our minds, when we say deficit, we think government spends more than it makes and just consistently year after year, again and again, yeah. runs this, this primary deficit. And so that leads to a thing called um, fiscal dominance. So, so I get to to say some fancy terms. Fiscal dominance means the central bank gets so freaked out by the um, by the by these giant deficits that are being run, and they think, oh my God, the government's gonna have to default, the government can't pay this. And so the central bank lowers interest rates to to effectively zero or below in order to help the the government pay low interest costs to keep the government solvent. And I think there's indications that this has happened in Argentina. Um, that the central bank has kept interest rates very low. In, in broad, like the essence of what you're saying is right. I think the mechanics are wrong um, in the following way. Like you're right, like the, the government is spending more than it can, more than it should. And also it's very, this is some, not something you said, but it's consistent. It's, it's very elastic, meaning even, um, so for example, in the two, early 2000s, the, the price of soy spiked and tripled within like three years. So Argentina's exports, like a big part of Argentina's exports, you know, tripled in, in to total total quantity. And for, for the first year in like, you know, decades, Argentina ran a fiscal uh, surplus, right? Like it collected more taxes than it spent. Um, well, you'd think that if the soy prices, to, you know, are kept up, then the country could maintain that fiscal surplus and build up, build up its reserves. That's not what the Argentine government did at the time like a guy that gets a race and uh, gets a nicer car, right? Like, you know, the, the, the government got a surplus, then it increased spending. So that's like part one. And then part two is like, what does the central bank do to help the government spend more? In Argentina's case, there's not a, um, I, I can talk about the, how loans are structured, but it is not so much about the, the interest rate. It's more about like just regular printing. And when I say printing, I don't mean the metaphorical printing that the U.S is used to, which is like, you know, uh, bank accounts, digital bank accounts go up in zeros. I mean, like literal bills get printed more and more. Uh, if today you go to the to the bank um, and you ask for a thousand dollars, right? Like today you go to the bank and you ask for a thousand dollars, that's a million pesos, uh, a million uh, uh, pesos, which is a thousand bills. Um, it has to be a thousand bills. There's no, you know, the, it can't be larger. You, you, you need a thousand bills. There's and no that's big a denomination. This, it's not, it's yeah, not Zimbabwe. They haven't made the giant. The, they, we haven't made the giant leap. There's a 2000 one that is new, but like you often get the thousand one. Um, and it's a brick this size. And yeah. it comes in a bag that says central bank, you know, uh, official central bank counted a million pesos 
printed on last week. You know, like printed on, you know, November 27th. Uh, it, it, printed it's an expiry date. I gotcha. Yeah. No, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, like, so that's the central bank. Right. Um, yeah. So, so I was going to get to that, you know, and I said there they've lowered interest rates. That was just the first of the things I was going to say. That is another thing they've done. And that's not the only thing they've done either. Uh, they've done lots of other stuff too. Lots of like accounting shenanigans and things that are kind of complex to understand. But, um, and that's what I was reading before I, I came here, all the, all the central bank shenanigans that they've done because there, so there, there's a couple things they're doing. They're trying to keep borrowing costs low for the government. And then the second thing they're trying to do is compensate for capital flight. So the second, so the yeah. Argentina's first problem is the government spends more than it makes. And the second problem is that nobody wants to keep their money in Argentina. Um, and this is a problem, but, uh, so, so those are, those are obviously related. One main reason people don't want to keep their money in Argentina is because they see the government spending more than it makes year over year over year. And then they say, this is going to lead to bad macroeconomic stuff. I better not keep my money in Argentina or I will lose my money. So they pull it out. They put it in overseas yeah. bank accounts or they even moved, you know, Uruguay. Yeah. Yes. One, one detail, one detail on why do people don't keep money in Argentina when you say bad things will happen. Uh, those things have happened in the past multiple times. The last they happen one every week. Was, they happen every week. Well, I mean, they, the they happen every few years. Into, they happen every few. Years. Uh, in two thousand one, Argentina decided that you know your deposits, your dollar deposits are my dollar deposits now. You know, um, so people learned, uh, hey, if I put dollars into a bank account and it's controlled by an Argentinian bank, it, it, it might get taken away, right? So yes, right, and so so. As a result, you have capital flight. People are swapping their their Argentinian pesos for dollars or for some other sort of currency or, you know, quote unquote, hard currency. Um, they're swapping their dollars for other things that puts downward pressure on the Argentinian peso because if n people don't want a currency, the demand for the currency goes down. And so the price of the currency goes down, the currency gets cheaper. Now, Argentina's central bank really doesn't want the peso to get cheaper, uh, you know, because I mean, it, it will and it often does get cheaper, but it in general doesn't like that because that makes the uh, dollar denominated debts difficult to pay. So um, Argentina borrows in dollars externally from, you know, foreign countries. But interestingly, Argentina even issues dollar denominated debt to its own people. That's crazy. Who does that? Nobody. Like nobody would ever le lend. Like if you're, nobody would ever lend uh, in pesos right. unless forced, roughly. And these, and this turns out to be a giant excuse. Well, the the dollar lending in dollar denominated debt. So so what happens is that um, uh, the the government borrows in dollars. It says here you get this number of, of pesos, and you know at today's exchange rate, and then but but you're entitled to this number of dollars at the today's exchange rate, right? You get this. You get you know, I, um, uh, or I, I, I pay you, I pay you my pesos, right? And then the government gives me a bond that can be redeemed for dollars, basically. Dollar denominated debt. Um, or I guess you can, you can sell it in dollars, if, but nobody's going to buy that in dollars. Like nobody's going to pay their dollars for those bonds. Um, but then you get the, the central bank comes in and buys that bond from people and it gives them pesos. And then they have pesos. That's one way that the central bank prints money. That's one of the financial sort of uh, methods of chicanery. And the amount that it buys those bonds for is the face value dollar amount, which is ridiculous because you know inflation and depreciation are going to just destroy the value of that bond. But then they buy it at face value, which means they're buy they're pumping a ton of pesos into the economy. And so, so that's another way that they they print money. Uh, is by buying those dollar denominated bonds. And that's, um, and I just found out about this. Like I found out about this literally an hour ago. <laughs> I had no idea they did this and I still don't know entirely how it works. So perhaps you can explain how the weird dollar denominated bonds work. Are you talking about the leaks? I guess, yeah. Yeah. Just look at the financial accounts. I don't know the name. I think there's multiple types, uh, but there's, there's one where, I think the, the one that is the biggest by, Kind of percentage of monetary emission. I'm not sure if that's exactly the one you're talking about, but the one that is the biggest bomb that will explode soon is is might be peso denominated, but with a with what is expected to be a real rate of uh, a real interest rate. Meaning, you know, if inflation is 160 percent of year over year, the rate of this vehicle is like 120, so 180 or something, like 20 percent 
bigger than that. We have that in America. It's called a TIPS. A TIPS, yes. Treasury yeah, Inflation yeah. Protected we, Security. Right. So we, inflation, we have inflation-proof tips. bonds. Inflation-proof bonds. Exactly. exactly. We have we have a, a form of TIPS um, that the the central bank forces kind of like works with the um, the actual banks. And it's meant to keep some of the money out of the economy as well. So there's like two types, right? Like one, one where like the government itself takes some bonds and that kind of buys them and holds them. But there's another one where, where like the central bank, even though it kind of printed some money and like put it in the economy, it asks the, um, the regular banks. So let's say we're talking about Banco Alicia, which is a regular bank. Hey, Banco Alicia, you have a lot of deposits. I would like you not to lend them. Right, because if you lend them, you're kind of creating money. You're putting more money out there, and that's my problem. My problem is there's too much money out there. So instead of you putting the money in the economy, there will be a loan and create money. I will ask you to give me the money. Uh, so I kind of put it out of the economy. I'll give you a bond. This bond will be in real kind of real interest rates. It'll be at 180 um, percent, and that way I kind of keep this money out for a little bit. But I just like make the problem worse because when I do pay back the loan, right, I I, I gotta pay with interest. So like I'm actually I'm actually just like promising that I'll print more money in the future to pay back for this loan. And by doing that, you're kind right. of holding the money supply a little tighter and a little tighter and a little tighter for longer. And those are what we call the leaks. And that's the main, the main problem people are talking about. I'm not, and I don't think those are the same ones you discussed, but if you give me the name of the, the vehicle you just right. talked about, I could look it up. Okay. But I guess this, so I guess the real, the real point here is that most of these things really boil down to one thing, which is the central bank supporting the drip borrowing of the treasury. Yes. The, the government of Argentina borrows money to pay for its lavish welfare state. It has the welfare state of a rich country, even though it's a middle income country. It has a welfare state it cannot pay for. Everybody is very attached to this welfare state. Argentina borrows money and borrows money and borrows money to pay for the welfare state. The central bank supports this by printing a bunch of money and doing various other financial chicanery that increases inflation. This is, you know, getting bogged down in the details of exactly how they do this and, and the, the financial shenanigans they used to do this can distract some of the listeners from the basic point here, which is that this is the classic way that, that hyperinflations and, uh, you know, happen, um, is that the government borrows too much money and the central bank supports that uh, by essentially printing money or doing something like that. It's called monetary financing of deficits. And if you, you know, m- most of the hi- hyperinflations that we, that we have on record happened in Latin America. That is the land of hyperinflations. And it's because uh, there's a few in like, you know, there were the post-World War I hyperinflations in Europe. There were the, um, there's a few in Africa. Uh, you occasionally see them in some places. But then Latin America is sort of the epicenter of this, this kind of thing. And, and the people who study this, the economists who study this, look at dozens of episodes from Latin America, especially since the 1970s. There's been a lot of this going on. Argentina is just sort of the worst uh, here. They just keep doing this over and over and over. Usually what happens is that um, the government eventually puts a stop to it by balancing the budget and stopping printing money because now that you've balanced the budget, you don't have to print all that money. And then doing some big dramatic thing like to, to tell everyone that it stopped because uh, remember people have to know that it stopped. So they bring their money back into the country and they hold it in the country. And they stop trying to like basically escape this, this vicious cycle. Uh, so you need to do some big dramatic thing to tell everybody, guys, this has stopped. This is the end of it. So Brazil did this by changing the name of their currency. They, uh, you know, Brazil changed their, the, the old, I don't even remember what the old Brazilian currency was named. The current one is the, uh, the real which means real. That is exact. It's just a word. This, Hey guys, this is the real Brazilian currency. This <laughs> one we won't dilute in order to support the, the treasury. And so that's why the, that's, that's what that is. And so I don't know. Um, are you looking up what the old one was called? Yeah. Um, because the real is not that it's not that the, um, the old ones were also called real. It's not that it was like a, a new funny thing. Like, oh, this is a real one. There's a, there's a history of the, the Brazilian currency being called real. Um, uh, it, it, it has a, it has a history on, on like real also. I see the real history, but there was yeah. a, the Cruzeiro. Yeah. 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 But, but, uh, Which definitely sounds Cruzeiro like a 2010 does... startup name. Cruzeiro. Yes. Cruzeiro. Uh, yes. Um, it would be like a crypto yeah. u- Uber, but with crypto. That's what Cruzeiro <laughs> <Yes>. is. <laughs> hey everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsor. 
If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, and netsuite.com slash 102. NetSuite.com slash 102 to get your own KPI checklist. NetSuite.com slash 102. Yeah, Argentina also changed its currency multiple times trying trying these various things. It, it, mm. The currency change you often has to come with like some other plan that, that kind of legitimizes the currency. My okay. dad, my father uh, has seen, has seen yeah. in his lifetime maybe five or six R currencies. Real actually means or, it's royal, right? It's a joke. Royal. That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. It's royal. it's royal, not it's it's not it's not yeah, but yeah. it's real. Yeah, real. Um, it's royal. But uh, but that but that's uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So 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 anyway, the point is that the way you get out of a hyperinflation is that you, um, the way you get out of a hyperinflation is that you do some big dramatic thing to say, guys, we've stopped. We're no longer doing this. We are, you know, the government's going to balance its budgets now and the central bank is going to, you know, not print a bunch of money. And this is the new regime going forward. Right. And, and so often you have to do something big to, to quash inflation expectations. Um, and so mm -hmm. in, uh, in the United States, when we had not hyperinflation, but we had persistent high inflation in the 70s, the big thing we did was cause a gigantic recession. Two gigantic recessions, actually, but you know, uh, basically one um, caused by Volcker in the early 80s, like 81 was, I think, the, the worst year of that recession. We did that in order to tell people, guys, this is this is done. You know, this is this is over. We didn't have our inflation was not really fiscally uh, um, determined because we didn't run big deficits at the time in the United States. Like we didn't run big deficits under Carter um, or under Nixon or under any of those people. And then. Um, that, but, but the fiscal inflation is, is, is the worst because you get the sense that the central bank is kind of powerless and just following those, the, the government, following the treasury around, right? That they, they don't have an independent fiscal policy. That's why it's called fiscal dominance. You know, it's, um, I'm sorry, independent monetary policy. Fiscal dominance means the central bank is basically being controlled by proxy or, or you could do it directly by calling them up and yelling at them. But then it's being controlled by proxy by the treasury. The, the central bank has to print money to support these deficits. And then, um, and then what you get is you get this expectation spiral where people say, well, business people say, well, I know they're going to do that. So I know that, you know, there's these deficits. They're going to print money to support the deficits. Therefore, prices are going to go up. So I'm just going to go ahead and raise my prices right now, you know, and then everyone does that and they sort of raise their prices in a spiral. And then when they raise their prices, people don't have enough cash to pay for the stuff at the store. And so they are going to the ATM and being like, help, I need enough cash to pay for the stuff at the store. Um, you know, and they can't get credit, whatever. Or, or maybe they can get credit and the bank gives them cash by, by credit. But anyway, so the, the point is that the central bank prints more and more and more money or creates more and more credit. It's the same thing. Um, it, it prints more and more money in order to allow people to buy things at the higher prices. Then seeing that it's printing more money the merchants, the, the businesses, the grocery stores and the landlords and whoever, they raise their prices more because they know that this money is being printed. So you get this expectation spiral um, and the expectation spiral only ends when you know that the government has balanced its budget such that you're not going to get the spiral started in the future. Um, so it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient to stop it, to have the government sort of, uh, you know, do austerity. Anyway, I think this is what this is what Malay is trying to do. And, and all the talk of dollarization is just a cover for this basic process of balancing the government's budget, slashing the welfare state so that and, and making it clear that the central bank no longer has to support uh, um, uh, deficits forever. That's kind of my impression of 
I think at, um, in some, at some essence, you're right, but it is a little deeper than that. Um, so you're saying, yes, the objective is to prevent the government from spending more money than it has. Great. Everybody agrees with that. Now, why dollarizing? Dollarizing has two parts to it. One is it's the grand, that, that grand gesture of like, you know, we're doing it. Uh, we're, we're doing, doing a big thing. Become, yes. Yeah. That's right. It's big. Uh, and this peso doesn't matter. Like when we do the dollar, there, there won't be inflation. There will actually be inflation in other ways we can talk about later uh, in dollar terms. But the other thing is that a democracy is a democracy. It's not a dictatorship, which means that later some other government will come and it will not be Millet, right? And that's why dollarization is so appealing to a politician like Millet. It is a way to tie yourself to the mast. This is Ulysses saying, hey, I'm going to tie myself to the mast. And in the future, you know, even if I wanted to, I can't. Uh, so that's why dollarization is so appealing. It's not, it's not only trying to balance the books today, it's trying to balance the books in the future. And dollarization does not mean that the books will be forever balanced, right? Like Ecuador uh, was you know, dollarized in 2001 or two, uh, I forget exactly. And it, it has mostly run a, a balanced budget, but recently it has spent more than it has in dollars. But to do so, it had to ask for money in dollars. It couldn't print it away. So even though their fiscal spending kind of, like they have a fiscal deficit and they're overspent, there's at least a cap to how much they can do so. They can do so as much as they can tax. They can do so as much as people would lend them. In Argentina, that is not true. They can do so as much as they want uh, through printing. And that's the cycle that Millet is trying to end, not only for himself, but also for the future. And there's a lot of if statements attached to that, meaning um, there's many ways in which you could dollarize and also not achieve that goal. Uh, I can talk about those if you want, but the, the, the way in which you dollarize so that you kind of yeah, balance I, I want the, the listeners, the, I think the listeners, you know, eyes will kind of glaze over by all the, the institutional details of how these things work. And while it's yeah. interesting to talk about them, I think the thing we, you know, we should get across to the listeners and, and I'm, you know, kind of mildly interested in the details of dollarization. Yeah. Um, but then I, I think that the, the key point is like why this is being done and, and what the goal is. But I think what you said, uh, uh, excuse me, <coughs> what you said about tying yourself to the mast, I think was really important because, uh, you know, it's a commitment device. It's a way to say, um, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, basically if your financial system has to run on dollars, sort of like a gold standard, but for dollars, right. then you, uh, the only way you could go back to the old regime was by just undoing that, which you could do, right? Like if you were, um, if you were an Argentinian government post Malay and people are like, oh, dollarization is preventing us from getting this welfare state that we want. We want more welfare state. You could say, well, guess what, guys? Dollarization's over. We're going back to the old way. Yeah. It's like you're not tying yourself to the mast. You're handcuffing yourself to the mast, but the key's in your pocket. It, so, yes and no. Like it depends on what what you think the the public will want. And in Ecuador, if you poll uh, Ecuadorians, they'll you know eight out of ten will tell you like dollarization is the best thing we got. You know, it's the best thing that has happened. Uh, I don't care who's president, sure. but that's not going to go away. So like the key so is the in question the public's is, what, pocket. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? It's because they have, they have, uh, and this may go away in the future, but that's because they have huge scars from dollarization. Sorry, sorry, from hyperinflation before the dollarization. And they attribute the end of hyperinflation to the dollarization. And they kind of don't care who, who did it or what, but in some, in some ways they think the stability that we have today, we owe it to that. We don't owe it to our politicians. And that has persisted in their memory. But, you know, memories are generational. I mean, you know, maybe the, the next generation doesn't remember this. And there's a big recession that has nothing to do with the dollars or, or, or it does, it doesn't matter. And people forget about the hyperinflation and they vote again to go back to their to their old currency, which I think was sucres or soles. Yeah. Um, so, and then, as you said, like, it can be reverted, but at least it's in the hands of the people and not in the hands of the printing machine, which is like always just phone, one phone call away. Um, Right. You, you would need a, you know, a major legislative effort. Uh, you know, you'd, yes. you'd need a government to say, guess what guys we're going back. So it's right. not a complete commitment device, but you, there is, you know, it is sort of sticky there. Um, right. yeah. So, so that, that absolutely makes sense. And so, so right. Dollarization. Is, so, but the, but the, really the goal 
is ultimately to shift Argentina to a country that lives within it, who, whose welfare state lives within its means. Yeah. Um, where you're, where the amount of free lifestyle that you're handing out to the people of Argentina depends on the amount that the Argentinian economy can produce. Yeah. And, and the voting is this patterns actual stuff. reflect that. Housing and food and everything. Services. The, the voting patterns reflect that. Is that recently or have, have people been trying to do that? Like what, what, what changed to make it where now it's finally? Yeah. What, what do I, what do I mean by that? Um, so the voting patterns have always somewhat reflected that, but the, the last election is a special one because a new candidate that barely existed four years ago won a presidency. Like um, the previous outsider that won the presidency was Mauricio Macri who had been mayor of Buenos Aires for eight years and before that had a, a career as a public figure. Millet is like a new phenomenon. He just like appeared on the scene like four years ago or so, like a little, a little more, but like roughly. Um, and when I say the voting patterns reflect that, I mean that uh, the welfare state, uh, the, uh, it's kind of geographically concentrated. Uh, what do I mean? Much of the poverty of uh, Argentina is concentrated around the city of Buenos Aires in the outer uh, outer layers of Buenos Aires. So that's much of the welfare is going there. The other part of the welfare is going to kind of pu the public sector in the provinces. So not the land workers, but the like people that work downtown in the provinces. There's a lot of handouts that go from like the federal government to the poor provinces around Argentina. And then when you look at the voting patterns, the city of Buenos Aires, like the, the, the core downtown voted for Millet, the outside, I guess, the welfare voted against Millet. Um, then the landowners and the land, the people that work in the land, which is not the owners because there are a few, like the people that work the land voted for Millet. And then the people that work at the downtown of the provinces work, voted for the opposition. So like, it, it's like, as you zoom in, it's like very split. Um, and and that's, that's roughly it. It's like people, it's like, do, do you receive welfare or not? If you receive welfare, you voted against Millet. If you don't receive welfare, you do not vote against Millet. Right, and I and I think that's what um, that's what listeners need to take away is that ultimately this is a fight, you know, about the the welfare state itself. Yeah, and so yeah. Anyway, um, about inflation, there's lots of interesting stuff to to be said. I read the um, the the notes, Sebastian, that you made. Yeah. Yeah, inflation is a different phenomena when it's at, at you know sub ten percent or eight percent, the way the U.S. has has lived it in the last couple right, of years. Right, right. Yeah. When it's like one hundred and sixty percent, and that's something that is very hard for economists in the U.S. to wrap their hand around. Um, one common thing uh, U.S. economists uh, will say is like, well, you know, everybody just raises the prices a little bit, and like the world just keeps going. Uh, yeah, maybe at eight percent, that's true, right? Like, you don't notice most most prices changing a little bit. But when things right. are changing 160 percent year over year, um, there's a whole part of the economy, like meaning everybody has to think about how to update these prices at all times, right? Like, um, and this has become sort of a if, national sport in Argentina is like hedging against inflation on a day to day basis. This is um, interestingly when when you asked uh, economists in the 1960s why inflation is bad, they were like struggling to think of reasons why people hate inflation. They probably got the wrong reasons, but one of the reasons they said was, "Oh, it's just so irritating to have to do this all the time." It's called shoe leather. That's a big costs. part of it. You know, they, they call that. Yeah. And that's for, that's for, but that's a really different kind of inflation than what America experienced in the seventies. Like in the seventies, your prices wouldn't really change day to day. They'd change month to month. Uh, and it wasn't right. hard to plan for these things necessarily. Uh, the reason people hated inflation was something else. But, but in these, yeah. in, in, in these complete basket case, hyperinflationary, uh, you know, or the word hyperinflation has an official definition that's not very helpful. You know, it's supposed to be yeah. like some sort of thousands of percent. But like, honestly, if you get above 20 percent, you're in this regime. Sure. When you get above 20 percent inflation, you're in the you're or 40 percent. Like you're at the point where like it's making a big impact on your life and it's annoying. Yeah, I think the way you don't know how to invest in order to invest your money. Well, yeah, nobody so. invests and that's that's because of inflation. But like, uh, I think that the, the more natural way to think about it is not so much about the regime in terms of percentage. It's more about the regime in terms of like time. Um, what do I mean? There's like threshold effects. So let's say that you have an extra thousand pesos in your wallet, right? How painful is to keep them in your wallet? Well, if inflation is 40% year over year, 
you don't mind having them in your wallet for an extra week, right? But that, that's kind of how you should think about it. If inflation is, is 200% every year, maybe you start thinking in terms of like a couple of weeks, like if that's too much. When inflation is like a thousand percent every year, then like every week that passes, you're, it destroys you. Um, right. So because there's a threshold effect, because there's a fixed cost to thinking about it. Right. You know, you have a you have a cost to mental calculation. And you either decide I'm going to think about it or I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And the threshold you is don't like, have like I'm going to increase my thinking about it a little bit. No, no, you don't. Exactly. You either think no. about it or you ignore it. And then the, the, the threshold is not just thinking about it. It's like, you got to call a guy to change your money, right? You got to be like, Hey, I have this extra pesos. Can you give me dollars for it? Uh, you have to decide what do I spend it on? What do I invest it on? So you have to kind of be playing this game constantly. And at 40% year over year, you do, you do absolutely think about it, but not every day at a thousand percent year over year, you think about it every minute. Um, like there's, there's like nothing you can think about that. It's not that, uh, Argentina is now in between those two logarithmically which means that uh, you think about it like week to week and prices change a little bit week to week. And if you get paid a big chunk, a big chunk of money at the end of the month, you have to think about, okay, uh, do I spend my entire salary this first week and stock up for the whole month? Do I set some aside and like go to the money exchange and get some dollars? What do I do with it? And then finally, one thing that is unappreciated is you, you said like, what do I do with this money? Where do I invest it? Is that you actually, it's very hard to save because um, the price levels don't all move together. Meaning, you know, if inflation is uh, 8%, the prices are all moving slowly and there's some unevenness, but like you can think about it a little more even, like 8% across many things. Um, right. Still not true, but like a little more true. In Argentina, something may shoot up like 200%. And the other thing may shoot up only 80%. Right. So the relative prices are going like crazy. What is happening the, to the your The recalculation salary? of what you're going to buy and what you're going to hold off buying just creates this enormous cost, you know, this right. enormous like day-to-day -day cost of, of managing your, your daily finances. No one needs that. Right. Like, no one, that's just that. a, that, that's so annoying. So there's some other things, uh, in a, in an economy with, um, with eight or 10% inflation, it only, that only punishes, uh, that only punishes savers that only punishes saving at the beginning. Because when inflation goes up from 2% to 8%, whoever had been, you know, I had a whole bunch of bonds that paid 2% it, back in a 2%. I had a whole bunch of bonds that paid 4% back in the, a, the you know, 2% regime, right? Inflation regime. And so they had a positive real rate of return. Now they have a negative real rate of return because inflation shot up to, to 8%. And so what happens to those bonds? Their prices crash because now they're not worth that much because they're, the amount they pay is fixed. The percent they pay is fixed, but the, you know, the meaning of that percent basically disintegrated. So that happens. And that, but then afterwards, after that happens, then new bonds, they just add in the inflation rate. They say, okay, well, you know, it was 4%, uh, you know, now we're going to make it 10%. Done. Now you go back to basically the same way you were. So if you have high and stable inflation, then, um, then it's actually only bad for savers at the beginning. It's like a transitory effect on savings and it acts as like a debt forgiveness. It acts as like a one-time redistribution, which is exactly what we had uh, the other day in America. We had this in 2021, early 2022. We had a redistribution of wealth from borrowers, the people who had this over these overhangs of debt, often all the way from 2008, from the Great Recession, and the government. We had this redistribution of wealth from the people who owned those bonds to the people who had borrowed money. And you can say that if the government regularly does that kind of thing, well, then it, it rewards, uh, it rewards uh, borrowers over savers. But then the point is that if it regularly does those things, the, the lenders recognize that and they just raise the interest rate that they, they charge. And so, you, um, and so it stops doing that. But so with, with a very high inflationary economy, like 40%, 100% inflation per year or whatever, then, or, or higher, you get um, you're punishing savers without actually rewarding borrowers, right? Because savers are unable to incur massive risk, inflationary risk, because high inflation is volatile inflation. So if you've got 8% inflation, right, then and the 8% inflation, maybe it'll go up to 10, maybe it'll go down to six, it'll fluctuate, but you know, the, the fluctuations won't be huge. But if you have hundred percent inflation, then the fluctuations will go up to like 120 to 80, blah, blah, blah. And so 
the um, these small changes that just naturally happen can utterly crush your bonds. And so no one wants to save any money. No one wants to lend any, because remember, buying bonds is both saving money and lending money. Saving money and lending money aren't really different things. And so nobody wants to save any money. Nobody wants to lend any money because of this massive uncertainty. But that doesn't necessarily help borrowers either because sometimes the inflation goes up and then the borrowers get rewarded. Sometimes it goes down and the borrowers get punished. But either way, the uncertainty hits the borrowers too. You're thinking, I'm borrowing at 100%. What if inflation suddenly goes down to 80% one month because it's volatile, right? What if it goes down to 80 and suddenly I can't pay off my debt and I die, right? So, so the high inflation hurts the Argentinian government, which is the main borrower, and it hurts the Argentinian banks, who are the main lenders. It hurts the borrowers and the lenders. So, so we have to differentiate in terms of inflation's impact on you know, borrowers versus lenders. A, a single burst, a single like step change in inflation will will hurt bar will hurt lenders and help borrowers once and that's what happened in america but a high and volatile inflation regime hurts both borrowers and lenders because it creates uncertainty that means no one knows how to save or borrow money and yeah. then so in they practice don't. what happens is that nobody borrows or lends like right exactly the, the, there's, there's just no loans like yeah, exactly. You you cannot get a mortgage in Argentina. That's just not a thing. Right. So the the way the way the there's no commercial loans either. Um, there's like overnight loans for for liquidity reasons, much like the repo facility. But there's no, hey, I'm you know I'm starting a bakery. Please give me uh, you know. Uh, and if there I and mean, if those exist, they are always in dollars, and they're between private citizens in dollars at you know their own accord. And are they under the table? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like much, much of our, you should think about the proactive. I'll just say a briefcase sure. full of cash, like in the movies. Yes. <laughs> yes. Briefcase full of cash. I love it. You, you were saying special. Um, yeah. So anyway, that, that that's my my like basic explainer of of inflation and debt and why in, uh, inflation is bad because. Imagine if you couldn't get a mortgage and you couldn't get a commercial loan to start a business and you couldn't get any loans except by having a briefcase full of illegal dollars under the table. Like you, the economy would suck. The real economy would suck. And so Argentina is stuck in this vicious cycle. It can't, you know, the, the, the macroeconomic uncertainty of this giant inflation that's always waving around prevents people from borrowing and lending, prevents businesses from actually happening and reduces productive capacity and makes Argentina a poorer country. In, in the US, we can fight inflation by raising rates. How do they fight? In, can they fight inflation in Argentina? How, how do they even try if they do? As we discussed, if nobody's borrowing money, the real economy is not exposed to the interest rate. And as Noah was saying, if the inflation is 140 uh, and you like make the interest rate, the real like the nominal interest rate 160, I still don't want to borrow or lend. Like, see what I mean? Like, it still doesn't work for me. So like. The, the, the central bank will move the interest rate around, but like it doesn't really have an effect on the overall economy because it's not like the, it's not like the U.S. Um, mortgage industry that like the entire real estate market goes up and down based on that little number. The Argentine economy is not exposed to that number, right? Like people are not uh, constructing based on those loans. So yeah, like there, there's there's a there's a valve there, but like it only moves certain liabilities between the central bank and the commercial banks. But the real economy that is not that much affected by it. And I wanted to make one more point that uh, Noah, you, you were kind of on the subject of why why is inflation bad for the economy? And one of them is like, well, there's no loan industry because of what I just talked about. The other one is that before loans, there's just no saving, right? Like you just cannot save. What is saving and lending are really the same thing, aren't they? Exactly. Exactly. Saving and the same saving thing. Money. And here, the same thing. there's one, one thing that is also hard to appreciate, uh, but I think Americans are appreciating it now. It's that mechanically, it is easier to raise the price of milk than it is to raise a wage, right? Like, what does it mean to raise the price of goods? So you go to like self spreadsheet somewhere and you like change the numbers. Now, getting a raise for your salary is much harder. Um, there's a lot of contracts, there's negotiations, people, it's much harder to like, negotiate salary raises, especially in, in places that have kind of low skilled labor that hasn't doesn't have as much um, collective bargaining power. So what that means is that as the money kind of gets into the economy, 
prices of goods are raised before the salaries. So the salaries are kind of always trying to catch up and behind the real, the, the kind of the inflation. So like, yeah, salaries do go up over time, but they go, they lag the real prices. So not only you can save because your union your account goes away, like your pieces are you know, burning in your wallet as you speak, but also uh, every month you're like a little behind on everything because everything is more expensive, but your salary is a little the same. And then eventually you get a raise and now you're like, you can breathe for a second, but only to start again next month, right? Um, and you can think about the, the, the good prices go, growing up kind of exponentially in a smooth curve, but you can think about the salaries growing up in like a stairway, staircase kind of seesaw pattern. And, you know, in parts of the seesaw, they are behind and in parts of the seesaw, they're a little ahead, but not too much. Got it. Yeah. So, so the problem here is that bad macroeconomics, the, the bad management of inflation and deficits is causing Argentina to become a poor and poor country. But Argentina responds to its steady impoverishment by trying to compensate with an increased welfare state. The increased welfare state can't be paid for, so that causes inflation. Uh, so it gets monetized, the, it, it gets borrowed, and that borrowing gets monetized, and that causes bad macroeconomics in the form of inflation. And you know this, um, and that makes the economy poorer. More inflation makes the economy poorer, and then people try to compensate with a welfare state, which causes more inflation. So you have a vicious cycle between welfare state and inflation, uh, where it's so high that it's actually making the country poorer. Now, you know, so so one thing that that listeners should realize is that inflation, high level inflation, doesn't always make a country poorer. Most countries that are industrializing are rapidly developing. So, like, you know, in the 1960s, you had rapid industrialization in like you know, Taiwan and South Korea, and you had, you know, Japan recovering from World War II, and you had all these things, this rapid industrialization in some of these countries, these countries were running 20% inflation at the time, pretty high. And, um, and, and Korea actually allowed it, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to run 20% inflation. It didn't really hurt their economy because A, it was pretty predictable inflation. It wasn't this cycle that hurt savings. And, um, and, Everyone just sort of planned for prices to go up next year because they, their incomes were going up too. And they all knew it would happen. And it was just a thing everyone understood. And so the 20% the inflation was fine. Um, because it was the, the reason it was happening is because of the massive increase in, de, in demand from rapid industrialization was actually causing this inflation. And so, um, and lending and such. And, and, but it was very predictable. But um, so, so this idea that inflation itself is this, uh, you know, at all levels is this horrible thing to be minimized and we need to go to deflation, blah, 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 and hard money and et cetera, et cetera, isn't always true. Rapidly developing countries often can, can sustain a decent rate of inflation. But when you get inflation that happens from the fiscal uh, side of a country living beyond, persistently living beyond its means or trying to live beyond its means and, you know, compensate for that with printing money, um, and, uh, you know, and then that you get into that vicious cycle, then you get really bad stuff. And so I think, um, yeah, Argentina is trapped in this vicious cycle. What Argentina needs, you know, of course it needs the, the austerity and the, you know, the sort of the, the big splash of, of, you know, of monetary and fiscal austerity at the same time that then, and this big thing, maybe dollarization that convinces everybody that, uh, that, that regime is that vicious cycles over, but then you have a, you end up with a smaller welfare state, right? You end up with people not getting the, the living standards that they're used to. And they'll be mad for a long time about that because they'll be forced to downgrade their lifestyle. Um, you know, that lifestyle wasn't sustainable. It would go in and out and would, you know, be good in good years and then crash in the bad years when the economy crashes from the macroeconomic policy. But then, but they're going to have to learn to, to live with less. But the, but the thing is then, do you stop there? Do you just say, okay, live with less. That's it. It's better to live with a bit less every year than to live with like more during the good years and much less during the bad years. It's better to just smooth the cycle out and be a little poorer all the time instead of a lot poorer some of the time. Is that all you want to do? I'd say no. You know, I'd say that Argentina needs to replace the some of its welfare state. I mean, you're you're always going to have some welfare state, obviously, but it needs to replace some of its welfare state with a development state. It needs to grow. Argentina needs growth, and just because you just because you take away the big barrier to growth, just because you take away the crazy inflation, 
uh, right? And this uncertainty, and you have a real commercial loan market and mortgage market, whatever. Again, you know, you reestablish lending and borrowing. Even then, it won't auto, you won't automatically grow the economy. Um, you'll you'll need a development state. You'll need a state that says, "All right, you you're allowed to build housing in this area. You're allowed to build a factory in this area." Um, and uh, you, let's build a mine. We have this copper on the border with with Chile. Let's mine that copper. You know, so you'll need the, something else to 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 replace welfare, some of welfare with growth. Yeah. So l let me make a couple of points around um, when you say like the welfare state. Um, I think you mean two things. One is like direct cash transfers to the most poor. Um, right. Argentina poverty rate is higher than the US and also it's not the same because what the US considers poor is is, is kind of rich here. So sure. we have two numbers. We have people that are poor here and then we have people that are like starving, right? And that's right. a very unfortunate thing, but Argentina has a significant part of its population, you know, not eating at night, you know, drinking mate, drinking tea at night. Um, and that's a, that's a very tragic thing and that will continue. Yeah. And hopefully the welfare state can continue to provide those people with food. Right. Like that's, right. you know, even though I am very much a pro austerity and I would like the country to decrease its deficit in spending, I do not want right. those people to eat even less. Right. I would like them to. Eat you less. have to triage so your there's, welfare there's state. Part of it. Exactly. You have to triage your welfare state. Exactly. So that's one part the, the uh, indigencia, we call it, you know, the absolute poorest, which should try to help those people. Now, there's another part of welfare state, which is like uh, public employees. You know, do we need as many public employees as we have? That is a form of welfare as well. It's very like the 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 state is very unproductive, and we have a lot of it. Right. We have a lot of you know municipalities and municipal employees. And I've been in their offices and they don't do much. Uh, I've waited in their work. queues and it's a bit yeah, it's fake work. Um, so if if much of that goes away, much of that may be still just wrong, but if some of that goes away, and those people who are otherwise smart and intelligent can go and do other things in the private sector, um, that would be very positive for the country, right? Like. Uh, if that person is, that oh, makes yeah. it very easy. Yeah. That'd be very good for the private sector. And some of that happened in the nineties. Um, the nineties were a, a time of a lot of things in Argentina, but one of the things that happened was that the, the, like the spending in, um, many, many public institutions were privatized and that kind of forced some of this change, right? Like the telephones were public companies. They became private companies. The oil company became a private company and so forth. And that made the economy much more dynamic. And that was generally a positive thing for the economy and the economy boomed. So that's one right. easy way in which the state can be a development state. It's not by like directing the economy too much. It's simply by like kind of deciding, okay, we're going to spend less uh, on, on our, our services that are not very useful. And we're going to let the private economy do those or, or, right. or not, or do whatever it wants. And that's going to be, that, that, that I think will be uh, a net productivity gain kind of like right away. Right. What are some, uh, you know, on, on privatizing oil companies, I think there's been mixed results uh, with this in, in the mm -hmm. world. I think that usually the privatized, a privatized oil company and an independently run state oil company that is basically not subject to government micromanagement is the same thing uh, that, I've, that I've seen. Um, so, for example, uh, in Venezuela, um, PDVSA, the, the state owned oil company, was really great before yep. Hugo Chavez came in and decided to kind of raid all its investment money for his own personal projects and friends. But um, so that was right. That was a thing. But then. Uh, but yeah, so so some things like transportation, sometimes some kinds of transportation work really well when privatized. Uh, and so then some kinds don't, you know, like uh, interstate highways, like like transportation that runs all across the entire country often doesn't do well with that. But like local transportation often often does. Um, and then uh, some other things. Yeah. Anyway, so what are the main things that Argentina could privatize in your view? Yeah. So he here's some anecdotes um, in Argentina before the 90s, um, people would buy apartments for the fact that they had a phone installed mm -hmm. because the telephone company wouldn't install enough phones in the apartments. So you would, yeah. you, if you had enough money and your apartment didn't have a phone, you would go and buy an apartment and the apartment was listed as having a phone. And that was part of a premium that you pay for it. 
Um, so that would be like the telephone company was a public company in the 80s, like before the 90s. And that, that's the kind of service you got here. Then in the 90s, it privatized, it privatized and like that went away. Mm-hmm. I see. Got it. Yeah. 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 Telecom so then when, that, when that was privatized, yeah, the private, the private sector is much better. It may be not perfect. It's like having AT&T. It's just like huge company that's right. pretty bad, but it's still better than the, the public bureaucracy. Right. Right. Americans, um, imagine something has, worse than Comcast. Yes. Imagine something worse than Comcast. And that was the Argentinian public telephone. Um, I can say the same about uh, many things. Uh, I can like go through the list. Some of the things that were either not fully privatized or, or went back into public. I, I don't know the, the actual kind of changes are like the electricity companies, um, which are government controlled for sure. I'm not sure if they're government owned or not, but they're controlled by the government. Mm-hmm. They are forced to have certain rates. Um, they're forced to operate in certain ways and resulting the Argentina gets blackouts every, every year. You know, at this time of the year in December and January, because they uh, made that the rates ideas. they charge are too low, so they turn to rationing. Yeah, it's not it's not only about the rates; it's also about like how much money do they have for infrastructure? Um, mm. You know, do they do they expand capacity or not? And you know, as the economy, sorry, as the country grows in capacity, there's more people. We turn on our ACs in the in the summer, and we lose power. Uh, this happened yesterday for like five uh, five seconds. But that's because there was, it was not such a hot day yesterday. Uh, in January, it'll be hotter, and thus we'll get ro- uh, blackouts. And often these blackouts impact the people that have the least agency because that's, that's those are the easier to contain. So certain poor neighborhoods will get shut down first, right? Like, you know, the poor neighborhood that is like barely on the grid, they, they'll get, you know, low balance, low shed, and they'll lose electricity for a few weeks while the rich people, us, me, will, you know, maybe have a blackout of 10 minutes and then the electricity will come back up. Um, and this is public, right. public en- energy uh, uh, at its best. So, um, so privatized utilities is the, the main one. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's the main one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, um, yeah, anyway, we could, we could go off on a tangent about privatization, but I think that sounds pretty good. The, 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 the thing about not mining copper is kind of crazy to me. Yeah. Well, there's also, I, I, will, I will say some stronger things, if you like, about copper and, and yeah, such things. Yeah, say that. So imagine, uh, let's talk in US, US terms, right? Like, imagine the federal uh, land, like the federal parks and all the land that the federal government owns. Uh, Argentina is similar. It's a huge country. Much of it is deserts and tundras and, like, non-productive land. That's much of where the copper and the other minerals are. And you can easily have um, somebody... Um, in the government saying, hey, you know, I think there's copper in this federal land, right? I think there's lithium in this federal land. Oh, that, that would be valuable. Great. Why don't you quit your job as the uh, head of copper mining in the government and go and buy from the government that land that could have copper? So suddenly, like the head of mining uh, the government head of mining suddenly owns the, the, the land that has the copper. So there's a lot of corruption involved in who has that land in the first place. Um, and the state, sure. when it owns those resources, has the, the power to like allocate them. And that's one of the big parts of why. Welcome to this thing called land. Yes. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's part of the story of why some of the, some of the, um, Mining resources haven't been been t- tapped, right? So, so a development state in Argentina would cut through that, those problems. Would would basically make sure that someone uh, mines the stuff. And of course, it's going to be done in a corrupt way. You know, cronies always get the mines. They always get the the big payouts from mining the stuff, and then you tax them, and then blah blah. blah. Yes. And then people, then then some miners are underpaid, and they strike, and blah blah blah. I, don't, I mean, like, welcome to mining. But like, yeah. Uh, but but then leaving it, leaving the copper in the ground is dumb, and just you know it makes the people of Argentina poorer. And I guess absolutely my my verdict on Argentina, although you know it's not a thing I I look into a lot. Like I just now started reading a bit about it because I've you know, uh, you know I I know the the basic idea that it's a fiscal that that's a chronic fiscal mm-hmm. inflation, and beyond that it wasn't that interesting. But now I'm kind of interested in like what they could do after the fiscal inflation ends, you know, like what they could do mm-hmm. as a development state. 
a de- remember, a development state is not like um, a central planning state. It's not the same yeah. thing. And a lot of people who are highly ideological and who are used to thinking in terms of pro-government, anti-government, equate the idea of a development state with communism. And it's not. Sometimes yeah. a development state will plan a lot. And sometimes it'll privatize. You know, a development state could say, this would be better privatized, so let's sell it off, you know? And the development state yeah. could say, well, this would be this would be better if we if we like plan for these targets and blah, 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 and make these companies do this and that. And so and so then um, sometimes you have planning and sometimes you have privatization. It's just not the the thing about a development state is the goal, not the methods. Development state is pretty ecumenical. It's pretty flexible on methodology of what you use to get there. So if you look at like Park Chung Hee or, you know, any of these any of these famous development states, they would be willing to use tools that they called the, the tools that looked like communism and tools that looked like libertarianism mm-hmm. side by side at the same time. They did not care. And I'm, I'm really reminded of the, of the YIMBY movement. Eric, you know the YIMBYs here in, in California and America. Um, the YIMBYs do, are, really don't care whether the housing is housing that you get through deregulation, upzoning, allowing private companies to build housing, or public housing. So YIMBYs are in favor of doing both of those at the same time, right? They're in favor of having the government build a bunch of housing, public housing on federal land at the same time as they're in favor of having the of you know of of upzoning and allowing private developers to build what they want on private land at, at the same time just get more of the stuff and to me that's the essence of a development state it's that it's a goal oriented rather than a process oriented thing whereas communism and libertarianism tend to be both process oriented it's this idea that if we do things the right way good things will happen if we have the state plan things then then I believe good things will then happen. If we have everything, yeah. you know, done by the market, then good things will happen. No, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Sometimes it's like a weird mix of both. And um, and so that's, let me put in a good word for the development state. Eric, we should talk about this more on, on future podcasts, but I, also we should, we should do a mashup with Brad DeLong because he is sort of a historian of development states. And so then he's, he's really the, the expert on this, but um what the the cool thing about ending the 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 chronic fiscally driven inflation in Argentina, if it can be done, if Malay can do it, if dollarization is the key, blah, blah blah. The cool thing will be that it then refocuses the country from financial chicanery and tricks to uh, real stuff. It refocuses yes. from pesos on a spreadsheet to houses, you know, cars, TVs you know, like whatever services, um, I don't know, whatever services people buy. Tango lessons, I don't know. Pull out just stereotypes Beef, here. Wine. Beef, wine, yes. <laughs> the best steak in the world. More steak for everybody. Um, it's a lot of- I think Argent- Argentina is the only place that eats more beef than Texas. So I, I really yes. respect you all for that. And I think you have a bright <laughs> yes. future. Get rid yeah. of inflation and you'll have a, no one can eat that much beef and fail forever. I was going to say you made a before we close. I was uh, you made a very interesting point around the difference between process oriented and outcome oriented, uh, and then you asked the question, you know, what would Argentina do next? And there's two questions there. One is what it should do according to Noah the Economist or Sebastian the Citizen, and the other one is that what does the presidency want to do with it? And the current president Millet is very much ideologically motivated, so he's not he's process motivated according to your framework, right? He does believe that. Free, everything must go through the private markets. Everything is freedom. He does not kind of invert the way you invert and say, okay, the outcome should be a prosperous Argentina that is kind of industrialized or has a, uh, a growing economy. Thus, let's do whatever it takes. The, the thinking today in the current administration is very much everything should go through the private markets. Everything should go through kind of freedom of action uh, through businesses. So those two questions are not answered in the same way. Uh, after the Lawrence Right, right. So, so I think it, it's important to start thinking now about the, the post, a post macroeconomics Argentina. Yeah. Everyone always thinks of Argentina just in terms of macroeconomics and it all comes down to the question of how do we persuade people to cut the welfare state and cut the money printing? And that's an important question. It's a difficult question. It's a, it's a question that other countries should watch very carefully because they may have to do the same thing. Of course, lots of Latin American countries have done it uh, in the past. But, um, but I, think, I think Argentina needs the shift from macro to micro. Argentina is bound by chains of macroeconomics. And once it breaks those chains, it can escape. But then it will need the car of microeconomics to truly 
get somewhere. I just right. made up a metaphor. <laughs> well put, Noah. Awesome. That's a blur. rally and cry to, uh, to end. Uh, uh, Sebastian and I need to go eat some, uh, eat some steak, perhaps, uh, <laughs> this evening. Um, yes. Sebastian, thanks so I'm much for, for joining. Thank you both. Sebastian, let me, let me know if you're, in the, if you're in the Bay Area or if you come to the U.S. and we'll hang out. I, I go there all the time. Bye now. Bye, Eric. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Yeah.